There are seven types of prayer that we want to look at. So let's go to God in prayer at this time. Father, we praise you and thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit here. And Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we ask that you bring forth upon each heart and each mind the precious spirit of wisdom and revelation. Cause that every heart and every eye be anointed by your Spirit. Open the understanding of each heart. Cause the light to flood each understanding that you will cause, Father God, your word to be alive to us. Father, we pray that you pour forth the spirit of prayer upon your people as we look into your word. We ask, Father God, that we will break into new realms of prayer. We ask, Father God, that you show us the spiritual realm as you see it. We pray, Father God, that as the people go into your prayer in them, you will cause principalities and powers and wicked rulers of the darkness of this age and wicked spirits in high places to be shaken. You will cause even Satan himself, Father God, to tremble and to fear, even as your people rise to the fullness, of oh, Father God, of the depth of prayer that you have for us in the Word of God. And Father, we promise to always give you all the glory, all the worship, and the honor for all that you do. In Jesus' name, and everybody say, praise God. There are seven different uh, types of prayer that we're going to consider in this series. And this morning, I'll just introduce the subject and maybe touch on a little bit on the prayer of faith, comparing it with the prayer of supplication. Uh, so let me list all of them down. Uh, seven different realms of prayer. Uh, uh, set types of prayer, right? There are three realms of prayer and seven types of prayer. But we won't have time to look in the three realms of prayer. So the seven, we will look at the prayer of faith, the prayer of faith, or which most of you are familiar with, and uh, but we will still touch on that. And we have the prayer of supplication, the prayer of supplication, and uh, then we have the prayer of consecration. That's number three, and uh, then. Uh, we have also the prayer, uh, the, what, what we may call the prayer, let's see how we're going to put it. Uh, we have the prayer of faith, the prayer of supplication, the prayer of consecration, and uh, then we have prayer for revelation. Prayer for revelation, which is a different realm of prayer altogether. And then we have prayer in the spirit, which includes groaning in the spirit, which is... Uh, uh, the different realms of prayer in the spirit, and uh, then uh, we also have uh, uh, to consider fasting and prayer, because uh, it's a related subject. Fasting and prayer is a subject all by itself, and uh, all that is involved. And of course, we have uh, the prayer of intercession. So there are these seven different realms of uh, prayer that we look at. And uh, as has been expressed many times, I believe probably repeated here too, that uh, in each of these realms of prayer, there are all different types of prayer. The book of Ephesians chapter 6 says, praying after putting on the whole armor of God, to pray with all kinds of prayer. Different types of prayer, as the Greek, Greek uh, word says, different kinds, different types of prayer. And uh, each type of prayer requires different rules. And you don't judge uh, one field of prayer by the rules of another field. And that's where many people get confused. Uh, for example, sometimes they take uh, uh, the rules that apply to the prayer of faith, and then they start applying it to the prayer of intercession, and it does not, it does not work. It cannot judge it that way, just as uh, uh, certain types of prayer are similar, uh, just like a different type of games, you have, uh, and uh, I understand Australians love to play games, and uh, so uh, you have uh, tennis, and uh, then you have badminton. Now these two games are similar because they both uh, use rackets and squash, but they all use different types of rackets, and they all go by different rules. Then you have games like, uh, what is your favorite? Cricket, right? Uh, is that right? Cricket? How you pronounce it? Sounds like a little insect. Okay. Cricket. Okay. And uh, you have cricket and you have soccer or football. And uh, 
So each game has its own rules, has its own functions. And uh, we understand the difference between the prayer of consecration and the prayer of faith. That in a prayer of faith, you don't pray with ease, it did I will. But in the prayer of consecration, you're always concerned with if it did I will. It's a consecration to God. Uh, Jesus did pray that prayer. So if you take the if it did I will and put it in the prayer of faith, it becomes doubt and unbelief. You cannot apply those, uh, those two types of prayer the same way. Each has its feel. And uh, neither do we apply the rules for the prayer of faith to the prayer of intercession. For intercession, there is what I call a, a, a constant prayer and a time period. But in a, in a prayer of faith, you believe it is done and you're not moved by what you feel, you're not moved by what you see. And uh, you just believe that it's done and you confess that it's done and you visualize that it's done. But in the prayer of intercession, it involves the will of another person. We have authority over demon spirits, but we are not to exercise or have authority over human spirits. We are to learn to minister in such a way that they make a choice. And uh, so, to exercise faith for another human being, another human spirit which involves their free choice, we have to apply different rules. And you're going to see the whole realm of it. The church was born in prayer, and the church will end in prayer, and always, if you notice, preceding every great move of God is a period of prayer. There is no revival without prayer. Preceding all the great moves of God from the time of Pentecost up to the, these days that we live in, every great move of God has been preceded by a wave of prayer. And always is when God's people enter the closet that we begin to see and know that something is going to take place. And uh, that's what's happening all over the world. I said today, God is raising up people like Larry Lee and uh, Dick Eastman. And uh, there's a re-emphasis on prayer once again in the body of Christ. God is taking the intercessors on the closet and uh, putting them out uh, into the public ministry to bring an emphasis to people about uh, the ministry of prayer. Now just to show how important prayer is, almost in every, every chapter in the book of Acts, which is the story of the church, you will find at least some mention or an implication of prayer at work. So if you have your Bible, just have a quick run through, turn to the book of Acts chapter 1, and you'll notice that in Acts chapter 1, that uh, the church, before the day of Pentecost, gathered in prayer. Every chapter you find some mention of prayer or some implication of uh, prayer having been made. Chapter 1, the church was waiting in prayer. They were, the Bible says, about 120 of them, and they were in one accord, in one place. Chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, we see the coming of the Holy Spirit down, but the church was praying again. We find the church of Jesus Christ, who it was born in prayer, and it continues in prayer. Chapter 2, the church is in prayer. In chapter 3, Peter and John were not on the way to heal the lame man. They were on the way to a prayer meeting and along the way they heal a lame man. They were on the way to a prayer meeting in chapter 3. In the first few verses we read about that. Then in chapter 4, there was persecution that arose. Uh, we in chapter 4, now you can follow along as we go. <laughs> Praise God. Chapter 4, there was persecution that arose, and uh, then the whole church gathered together and prayed for more boldness. They prayed for more boldness. And uh, God answered, shook the whole place, and gave them a greater measure of boldness. And uh, then uh, in chapter 5, there's a tiny little verse that tells you in verse 12 that uh, they were all we won a call in Solomon's porch. If we study the word one accord in the first few chapters, that the word one accord points back to prayer. There were one accord in the upper room, one accord here, one accord there in Acts chapter 4. Now in Acts chapter 5 verse 12, they were in one accord. So in every chapter there's something mentioned on prayer. Then you go over to chapter 6, and uh, we are laying a foundation first. Uh, in chapter 6, you notice that they had uh, problems in the church. They had grumblings and uh, rumblings in the church. And uh, it was due to the women. And 
So it, it, it mentioned and uh, the, the, the widows, the widows uh, were not being fed properly. And some of the grumblings came from their mouth and some of their grum, the grumblings came from their stomach. <laughs> they were not being fed. And uh, so the, the early church apostles gathered together the church and said, and said, you appoint seven men and notice why it said they prayed for them. They laid hands on them. And they also mentioned, we want to give ourselves to the ministry of the word and of prayer. Then you look over at chapter 7. The first martyr died. Stephen, the first martyr died. Right at the ending, he prayed a prayer of uh, forgiveness and a sort of intercessory area. He prayed for all those who persecuted him. He ended his life with a prayer. It's about the third last verse from the ending in chapter 7. That is Stephen. Then when you go to chapter 8, you notice that uh, Philip had gone ahead. We're in chapter 8 now. And uh, chapter 8 follows chapter 7. Right? And uh, so chapter 8, you notice that uh, Philip goes and preaches and evangelizes in Samaria. All the people were born again. And uh, then uh, Peter and John came from Jerusalem. And he says they came to pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Every chapter there is a prayer mentioned in the book of Acts. Chapter 9, you will notice that uh, Paul was praying and waiting on God after he was uh, born again and he has met the Lord on the way to Damascus. He was waiting. He was not under the power of God. Three days he could not see. He was waiting in prayer. And Ananias came and laid hands and prayed for him. So we see here that the prayer is mentioned again. In chapter 10, we have Peter uh, in the afternoon, up in the upper room, caught in a trance. And guess what? He was praying. See, the church is born in prayer. Prayer never leaves the church. When prayer leaves, then we go back to our former religion without power. Prayer is a very communication with God. Chapter 11, we see Peter sharing to the circumcision party who met him after he went to Cornelius' house. And he told them once again about his experience uh, in falling into a trance. He prays mentioned. And uh, in chapter 12, we see that Peter was in prison. James the Apostle was killed by Herod. And uh, chapter 12, Peter was in prison. And the Bible says, constant prayer was made by the church for him. Now that was not the prayer of faith. It was a prayer of intercession. And that's a different realm altogether, which we could touch on. Given rules apply. Constant prayer. Chapter 13, verse 1 to 3, the church was praying together, the Antioch church came together, the leaders came together, and they prayed together, and the Bible tells us that uh, as they ministered to the, to the Lord and pastor, the Holy Spirit said. So they were ministering unto the Lord. Again, a prayer atmosphere. Chapter 14, they started the first missionary journey. They launched out into the first missionary journey. And uh, verse 23, on their way back, the Bible says in verse 23, they prayed and they fasted and they appointed elders. Again, prayers in the church. Chapter 15, we see the continuation of, uh, of this same move of God. And we see the Jerusalem con- Council in, in chapter 15. And uh, notice that in the whole conference, it tells us that they solved their doctrinal issues. And after that, they said it pleased the Holy Spirit and it pleased us. But right at the ending, Barnabas and uh, Paul had a slight uh, disagreement. And the Bible says that uh, they prayed for them, the church prayed for them, and they were commended by the brethren unto the grace of God. The word implies prayer. Hands laid and sending them off again on Paul's second missionary journey. Acts 16, notice that uh, the, ha- the highlight of Acts 16 is Paul is in prison and uh, he was, he was uh, with Silas in prison and they were praying at midnight and singing hymns to God. Prayer again in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17, in Acts chapter 17, we find that uh, they are now moving into Thessalonica. And uh, in chapter 17, Paul continued on in uh, his, uh, his ministry. And he was persecuted. He came down all the way to Athens. And the Bible says that at Athens, he preached to them about the unknown God. And he told them 
about worship. Two times the word is mentioned, worship is mentioned in the book of Acts chapter 17. He taught them the true worship. Now, worship and thanksgiving are part of the prayer uh, series that we're going to touch on. It implies prayer. Chapter 18, Paul was in Corinth this time. And in Corinth, this time uh, Paul, Jesus appeared to Paul and said, Do not be afraid that he had much people in the city. And uh, we find that in chapter 18, on his way back to Jerusalem, that... Uh, the Ephesian people told him to stay on and say, no, he has to go to Jerusalem because he has to keep his uh, feast there. Keeping the feast would imply keeping a time of prayer and seeking God in his life and ministry. He wants to go back there in Acts 18 to Jerusalem. The feast, that implies a prayer. Prayer session again. Chapter 19, verse 6. He went to Ephesus and he found a group of... Uh, a group of uh, these Ephesian uh, people who only knew John the Baptist's teaching and he prayed and laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. He laid hands on them, implies praying for them. See, all over in the book of Acts, we find prayer. But we find that he goes into a different realm of prayer as he goes along and in chapter 20, chapter 20, uh, about the third last words from... Uh, Chapter 20, about the third last words from uh, the end, they prayed, they knelt down on the beach, they cried, they said goodbye, and it says they prayed together. Chapter 21, Paul confronts uh, Agabus in Philip's house, and uh, in chapter 21, we see that uh, after all the various uh, prophecies were given, that they tried to persuade Paul from going to Jerusalem, and Paul said he thought that the Spirit asked him to go, and uh, in the end, after they tried to uh, dissuade him, and he was persistent in going, they said, the will of the Lord be done. That implies dedication unto the Lord. And uh, from chapter 22 onwards, we find that the prayer of dedication takes on a stronger and stronger role. See, we must understand what a consecra prayer of consecration does. Prayer of consecration is when you're going through a, a certain situation that God has asked you to go through, right? You, you are led by the Spirit to go through the circumstances and it takes many times a prayer of consecration to go through them. And you notice from chapter 22 onwards that as Paul prays, the crowds in Jerusalem, in chapter 22, that uh, as he spoke to them, he told them, he told them, it's, uh, in about verse 17, he told them that uh, when he was in Jerusalem, he was praying, he fell into a trance. That was when God confirmed his commission to him. Then chapter 23, he, he began to uh, testify before the Sanhedrin council. And in chapter 23, Paul spoke in verse 1 that he has lived his life to God in all good conscience. And we're going to see how the prayer of consecration deals with two areas. It deals with your motives and it deals with the timing of God. Very important. Each prayer has different keys that operate them and it deals in different areas. So if you have a prayer of faith but you don't have a prayer of consecration, do you know it's going to affect the prayer of faith? See, the prayer of consecration uh, deals with the timing of God and your motivation. A consecration. And uh, so his conscience, that talks about his consecration. And in chapter 24, now in chapter 24, he's on trial before Felix, the governor. And in chapter 24, as uh, he confronts Felix, again he speaks in verse 16 about living unto God a good conscience. He has lived a good conscience unto God. And uh, consecration. His life has been consecration. His motives are pure. And uh, in uh, chapter 26, are we in chapter 26 now? 25, right? We are in chapter 25 now. Are you all in chapter 25 now? Alright. In chapter 25, we see that this time he faced Festus. And as he spoke before Festus, he said in verse 10 and 11 that uh, he, he is blameless as far as his means are concerned, the question about his motives, and uh, his blameless, he has lived with God, he has dedicated himself unto God. Consecration has taken place again. Chapter 26, he faced King Agrippa. 
And as he placed King Agrippa in chapter 26, the Bible tells us that uh, in verse 19, he gave his testimony and he says, I have been obedient to the heavenly vision. He has a prayer of consecration made in his life. See, the prayer of consecration is important. And in chapter 27, we go on to uh, other areas. They got into a boat and uh, then uh, they, they were sailing away and then uh, they got in the storm for 14 days. They didn't eat. And then Paul prayed the prayer of thanksgiving and uh, that is related to thanksgiving is related to all the different realms of prayer. Thanksgiving, he broke bread and they, he told them to eat. And uh, because somehow he knew in the spirit that they are going to be shipwrecked and they are going to go somewhere. So he says to eat. They are not eating for 14 days. Chapter 28, verse 8. They landed on the island and there was a need of healing and Paul prayed. Paul prayed and then he laid hands and he brought healing to the father of Publius who happened to be the governor or the leader or the tribal leader in that place. So every chapter has, an, has something to say on prayer or an implication on prayer. Now, as we look at the overall picture and as you start off your emphasis on in, in prayer in this mind, it's good to understand how the church prayed all the different types of prayer. And this morning we're going to see especially the prayer of faith and the prayer of supplication because we need to compare them to understand that it better. See, the prayer of faith and all prayer relates to different time spent. The prayer of faith relates to a promise of God that is already fulfilled. It's in the past. It's been done. God has promised and the promise is fulfilled. Then, there are promises that are not fulfilled, they are in the future. Like the second coming of Jesus. You cannot pray the prayer of faith for the second coming of Jesus. It has not come to pass yet. It is a blessed hope that we are looking forward. So in things that are promised, but has not been fulfilled, a different realm of prayer is required. And uh, that one of the realms of prayer that is required is, of course, it's prayer in the Spirit is required, groaning in the Spirit. But another realm of prayer is the prayer of supplication. So let me just point to the prayer of supplication before I go to the prayer of faith. If we be, the, let's see the change over. The past as a prayer of faith, especially required to fulfill promises. If I'm talking too far, just wave your hand, shout, or dance, or something, just slow down, alright? Uh, this is not good enough for me, alright? <laughs> so, and, uh, so, uh, we got so much to cover. And uh, so, in the past, things that relate to promises of God, in the past, you uh, pray the prayer of faith, is to feel Christ has died for our sickness, for our poverty, and uh, for our, the spiritual death that we have faced, is in the past. So we pray the prayer of faith in order to receive that. There are some things in the future that God promised that we apply other realms of prayer, groaning in the Spirit, and the prayer of supplication in order to get into them, in order to be ready for them. And uh, of course, prayer of consecration is also involved. But in the present, sometimes a prayer of intercession is required because there are some people who haven't gone into what Jesus has fulfilled, and their choice and their free will is involved. We need to apply the prayer of intercession for them. So there's a present, there's a past, and there's a future. Now let's look at an example in the Bible. In the book of Acts chapter 1, as the church began, in Acts 1, we see that uh, Pentecost has not taken place yet. And since Pentecost has not taken place yet, they could not exercise faith to pray Mark 11, verse 22 and 24, to believe that they have received. Instead, they had to wait for 10 days until verse 1 or chapter 2 says the day of Pentecost had fully come. So what kind of prayer did they wait with? What kind of prayer may take time? Look at Acts chapter 1. Remember Acts chapter 1, they are standing way before some fulfilled promises. Christ has died, but the Holy Spirit has not been sent down. So there are certain things that they, they could exercise faith on that that happened in the past. But then it's in front of them that they have not passed through yet, that's not been fulfilled. They apply a prayer of supplication. But for us, we don't apply that anymore because we have passed that point. But let's look at Acts chapter 1 and uh, see in verse uh, 13. Acts 1 verse 13. 
He says, and when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and, what's the word? Supplication. Supplication. And the prayer of supplication was required. They could not pray the prayer of faith for the baptism of the Spirit yet because the Holy Spirit has not come yet has not been sent, is not fulfilled yet. So they prayed the a prayer of supplication and they, they waited and waited. It took 10 days. Jesus spent 40 days with them and uh, so there are 10 more days to go before the day of Pentecost. 10 days prayer of supplication. But after they reached the prayer of supplication and it has been fulfilled, the, baptism, the, Spirit has, the Holy Spirit has been sent, they never prayed the prayer of supplication again for the baptism in the Spirit. See, the prayer of supplication applies to things that are seen in the future. And uh, that has not been uh, fulfilled. And so for them, in Acts 1 it was not fulfilled, but Acts 2 it was fulfilled. And from then onward, they never prayed a prayer of supplication for the baptism in the Spirit. They prayed the prayer of faith. See, in Acts chapter 8, when they ministered the Holy Spirit, they didn't pray for God to send the Holy Spirit. They prayed for these people, the Samaritans, to receive the Holy Spirit. So they ministered by faith because the Holy Spirit has been sent. There's no, no more need to wait. It's a free gift. They only have to believe. And to believe, they need to hear the word sometimes. Because you cannot receive what you have not heard. Paul, next 19, after Ephesians, have you received the Holy Spirit? They say, we have not even heard. How can they have faith when they have not heard the word? If they have not heard the word of healing, they will have no faith on healing. If they have not heard the word on the Holy Spirit, they will have no faith for the Holy Spirit. See by the prayer of faith. Then, in Acts 19, we see the same thing. Verse 6, Paul just laid hands on them and they got the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was no more, uh, the baptism of the Spirit was no more something in the future, something in the past, and so the prayer of faith applies to it. Well, we're going to look more on the prayer of supplication and prayer of intercession, etc., and how it applies. And uh, just to point a few notes here, that uh, like for example in Acts chapter 4, when the whole church gathered together and prayed, they were not praying the prayer of faith. In Acts 4. They were praying a prayer of supplication because they were asking God to supply something. You know this? They were asking God to supply something. They were asking God to give them boldness. They did not say Mark 11 verse 22, 24 in Acts chapter 4. Instead, they were seeking the face of God for boldness. So we need to understand the different rules that apply to the different types of prayer in order not to be confused. We need to rightly divide the Word of God that we could benefit from all the different ranks that God has placed for the body of Christ to use in a, in a prayer, uh, in prayer warfare. As we go in church, so that we could put on the whole armor of God and pray with all kinds of prayer, understanding the various ranks of prayer. This morning, we will just look on principles that govern the prayer of faith. All that it entails and what actually takes place. In Mark chapter 11, verse 22 and 24, which applies primarily to the prayer of faith, Mark 11, verse 23 and 24, like read, that words, he say, For assuredly I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them. The Greek actually says you have received them, is in a past perfect tense. And you will have them. 
Noting to verse 24, there are three different senses. When you pray, present tense, believe that you have received past perfection, and you shall have them future tense. So he talks about past, present, and future in the promises that God has promised. You could exercise faith for them. And this is how it applies. And when you pray, you believe. But there's a whole realm there that verse 23 describes. The prayer of faith will deal with the area of our heart, our mouth, and our believing. Our heart, our mouth, and our believing. But I outline the two main categories that are important in the prayer of faith. One is the heart. See, the Bible says in verse 23 that if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in the heart, it will be done. You can say and you doubt and it won't be done. What goes on in your heart, in verse 23, that determines what goes on in your mouth. What goes on in your heart determines whether what you say is going to pass, going to come to pass. So there are a lot of people saying and saying, but their heart is in doubt and it has no effect whatsoever. The example of Abraham is marvelous unto us. Please note in Genesis chapter 12, the father of our faith. Genesis chapter 12, the life of Abraham. Please take note how old Abraham was when he left the land of Ur. In verse 4 it says, So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and the Lord went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. 75 years old. And notice that he changed his name or the part where we call his confession becoming uh, uh, actualized is in uh, a later part in his life in verse 17, verse 1. His name was still Abram. And in verse 1, it says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. And just to summarize the story, it was when he was 99 that God changed his name. 75 to 99. If you include the year that he was in, it will be approximately about 25 years. 25 years before he changed his name. From the day that he started walking in faith, as he walked into it, he walked into faith and what we call going by what you believe and not by what you see, the faith movement. For 25 years, he walked before he started confessing his name. Abraham, father of many nations. Sarah, mother of many nations. And one year of confession, one year, did a remarkable result. Because the Bible tells us that after he changed uh, his name in uh, Genesis chapter 19, Remember, Sarah is about 10 years younger. So if Abraham was 99, Sarah would have been 89. And uh, so, there they were, 89 and 99. Going on 90, going on 100. And uh, then only Abraham started changing his name. Sometimes when we read Abraham's story, we got the impression that he did it all his life. No. It was in that final year when he was 99 years old that God told him to change his name and his confession really took shape. Same with Sarah. And uh, how do we know the confession changed them? Well, we have one indication for that. Because in chapter 20, when Abraham went on a journey to the south and he passed by uh, Abimelech in verse 2 and verse 3, uh, he went by King Abimelech's place 
See Abimelech took one look at this 90 year old woman and he said, 90 years old. 90 years old. I can't do it like you are feeling this to be. And uh, so, so then he was, so there's some change that was taking place in Sarah. Remember, her womb was dead, Abraham's body was still out. And uh, God's operative confession started operating in their physical body. And that lady uh, is one of the beauty treatments. Watch thy mouth. <laughs> and uh, so, it, you can notice the change that took place in the body. I mean, who today falls in love with a 90 year old lady? There still may be some, if you're in that category, praise God. You have just stepped onto that blessing. <laughs> and they, they such a tremendous change. And uh, here, what did he do for the 25 years? We see that uh, in the book of Genesis, chapter 15, God deal in his vision. See, the prayer of faith has to deal with two areas of our life, the area of our vision and the area of our words. And if we miss these two, we will miss the prayer of faith altogether. In uh, Genesis chapter 15, we see here that uh, God took him in verse 5 and took him outside and said, Look toward the heaven, count the stars if you can, and of course you couldn't. And God says, So will your children be. So will your children be. And uh, then, the Bible tells us in uh, chapter 13, in verse 16, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that even men could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. So God says your descendants will be like the dust. Now notice God is dealing with his religion before he deals with his confession. Twenty-five years, God deal with him. God has him surrounded. In the daytime he has dust, in the nighttime he has stars. And he will see, and he will see, and he will see, and he will see. Twenty-five years God deal with his vision. And there are many people who try to pray a prayer of faith, but who has never known the keys involved. Vision and words are important. They miss out on vision, they got only the words part, and they got only one twenty piece of the whole prayer of faith. Twenty-five years, one year, compare them. And it's our vision that is uh, an important area when you deal with the prayer of faith. What do you see? And in the Bible, vision is so important that the Bible emphasizes it. And uh, you notice that the word heart and the word uh, dianonia, which is another Greek word for the word mind, is applied to the part of our mind that sees us, the imagination part, are always mentioned together. See, for example, in the Greek New Testament, you notice that in Mark 11 verse 23, it talks about cannot doubt in the heart. Then if you look at chapter 8 and chapter 10 of Hebrews, it talks about, I will write my laws in their heart. I put my laws into their mind. Put, their law, put my laws into their mind, their heart, and write my laws in their heart. The word mind is a Greek word, dianoia. There are two special Greek words for the word mind. One is the word dianoia, which talks about imagination. In Luke chapter 1, the same word mind has been translated. Look, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Looking at the prayer of faith, we will look at each type of prayer and see the laws that govern each one. Luke chapter 1, verse 51. He has shown strength with his arm, he has scattered the crowd in the imagination of their hearts. Notice when they mention imagination or dianoia, that's the Greek word dianoia. I don't know why they translate the imagination and Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10 is replaced it in my order, the same Greek word. But every time they mention dianoia, they mention the heart. Because it's connected. When Jesus was talking about, shall not doubt in your heart, he implies that the vision you see in your heart must be clear cut. 
Not vision of the past, but vision of what is to come. And if we don't have it inside us, we can never have it when we say it. So many people are praying a prayer of faith without getting a vision first. So unless the word of God writes a vision in your heart, what God has fulfilled, if you have a financial need and you cannot see a vision of yourself being prosperous, then you will never be able to speak yourself into prosperity, claiming on Christ, redemption from the curse of the law. We need that vision first. And it's uh, so important, and uh, we have touched on this before, and, uh, but we're just re-emphasizing on the vision part. And what we're going to consider this morning is that in the Hebrew word, God also regards vision as important. So in the Hebrew, He uses another word, and that's the word Yetzer. Yetzer, Y-E-T-Z-E-R, if you are uh, taking notes. Yetzer, and then word Yetzer refers to man's imagination. Let's look here in, uh, in the book of uh, Genesis chapter 6. Let me give all the scriptures first and then uh, we'll do some illustration on that. Chapter 6. In uh, words, let's read verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great in the earth, and the every yet year of the thoughts of the, his heart, the imagination as the old Indian school, of his heart was only evil continually. Notice that God destroyed this world in Noah's time, not only because of the works of man, but because of the imaginations that were in man. Because so God knew that if it was in man's vision, it would somehow come forth. Let's look at the book of uh, First Chronicles. Let's get all the scriptures out first. Because when you teach the truth of God, you need to support it. all the various scriptures. First Chronicles, and uh, this time we look at chapter 28, verse 9. First Chronicles 28, verse 9. Let's uh, read some scriptures first as we go to establish this truth. Can you verse 9? Notice what God says here. As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the heart, the yet of the heart. And there's something that takes place when a vision gets into you. In chapter 29, verse 18, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the yet year of the thoughts of the heart of your people, and fix your heart toward you. He is a yet year. The word yet year is a part of you that visualizes, that imagines. And unless you change your diagnosis or your age, you cannot change your circumstances. And this is what happens when people try to pray the prayer of faith. And uh, we need some people for illustration. Praise God. <laughs> praise God. And uh, praise God. And uh, praise the people. You come right up. Thank you. Now, we have, uh, praise God. Let's put you where the yet is, right? Um, right here, okay? So the yet part of you is the part is in your heart that visualizes, that sees. In the Greek is dianoia. Now this is where, praise God, brother. And uh, this, is, this is your, the outward life. This is the physical. The yet deals with the spirit realm. The confession deals with the physical realm, right? It deals with the physical realm and what you're going through. Now, uh, so what happens in the Yedja always takes place in the physical realm. God knows it. God speaks of Yedja as if it's a real thing. And uh, so to you, stand. Stand <laughs> Okay. And uh, now, if the Yedja is a tension, uh, you will follow. Everything he does, you do. Alright? Okay. And uh, so, so, when you change your yet there, now everything he does, you do. Right? If the yet there goes, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> okay. Alright. Uh, now, you see, that is automatic. All you have to do is take care of the yet there on this part. 
my my husband is mm, <laughs> okay. What happens is that now if whatever I try to do to you, don't change. You must keep following him. All right. What happens is many times we try to deal in the physical realm. We got a problem in the physical realm, etc. We forget about the visualizing part, and we try to do everything we want in the physical realm. So we ch- try to change it. We go, oh, we go, and it goes back. And you wonder what's wrong. You know, I'm trying to play our things and I'm doing my best. And you try to change the circumstances again. You go, ah, <laughs> we are not going to start a fight here. <laughs> but, ah, and you, the moment you let go, it goes back. You're wondering, why can't my life change? Why can't my physical circumstances change? Why don't you change? Because we're dealing in the wrong realm. We're trying to change this realm from what we see instead of changing the imagination in the yet there. If God considers the yet there the real part, the real thing, turn to the book of Psalms. Psalms. And uh, we look at Psalms uh, 103, verse 14. Psalms 103, verse 14. For he knows our frame. The interesting thing is that the word frame is the word yet there. Same word that is translated imagination in Genesis 6, but here translated frame. God considers the yet there the free. Now, before He made you, He made you in the yet there, the frame. Then in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, By faith we understand that the world were framed. By the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible, implying they are invisible. So many times we try to change what we see from the outside without changing the invisible realm. So no matter how hard we try, we forget that part. Abraham took 25 years to change that before he went to confession. And we struggle, but inside us, we are seeing the wrong thing. And the prayer of faith is ineffective. The prayer of faith applies very much to the heart as much as to the mouth, although it's emphasized three times. Now, in the book of Isaiah, please, then we need to the book of Isaiah. And uh, this time, we look at chapter 26, verse 3. And I just want to show the translation. 26, verse 3. And it says, You will keep him in perfect peace, his yet there is faith on you because he trusts in you. Then in chapter 29, verse 16 of same book, Isaiah. Surely you have seen turn around, shall the potter be as seen as the clay? For shall the king make say of him who made it? He shall not make me, or shall the king form say of him who form it? He has no understanding. Now you can't find the word yet there in the English, but the word yet there is this word called the king me. See, God regards the yet there as a king in the spiritual realm, in the invisible realm. If you could get it in the yet there, you will get it in the visible realm. For the things that are visible are made of that which is invisible. What you will be tomorrow or the next year is determined by what you have in your yet there today. Where you will be in your church, in your ministry, in your finances, in your healing, 
is that unless your Yajna is changed, there will be no change in the physical realm. No matter how hard you try, 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 it will go back to where it is. But if you cease your struggling and work in the spiritual realm and change your Yajna, <laughs> that will change without any, any effort at all. You need to remember we have to work in. We have to work out. God deal with Abraham's life all the time in that realm. Praise God. Thank you. You may not go, go back. Praise God. And uh, so we have only looked at one type of prayer, the prayer of faith. Now each type of prayer relates to certain things. And uh, this is a series that we are trying to compare and, and show. And in the prayer of faith, we are only touching and doing it. So introduction on each type of prayer. And uh, uh, on prayer of faith, we need to understand that these are the two main keys. I'm going to point to the main keys. So that as you go to this month, you can, can find a place and place all the other teachings in a various uh, setting and structure that we give. And uh, so it's important for us to, to understand that you cannot succeed in a prayer of faith unless we change our visualizing. Visualizing is the key in a prayer of faith because when you see it correctly, you will say correctly, the great power release. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we praise you and thank you for this time that we have in you. We consider the realm of prayer. And we pray, Father God, that as you begin to move into the realm of prayer, into the depths of the different types of prayer, we will transform and change our lives utterly. That we will move into the full depth of Father God a prayer that you have for us in the Word of God. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.